Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of brandy, the show of South Africa, banking, Hollywood, all of the above. Today's guest is the regional sales manager for Texas for Copper and King's American Brandy Company, Mr. Jono Marcus. I met Jono a couple of times and we had to sit down and talk and we sipped some apple brandy, some grape brandy, some absinthe, lots of great things coming out of the Copper and King's Distillery in Kentucky. I'm a huge fan of their Butchertown brandy, which is an unfiltered cast strength mix of various aged brandies. But but that's not the totally interesting part about this conversation. I know very little of South Africa, very little of the social structure, how it is to grow up, the kinds of things that kids do and get into trouble. And Jono was born and raised South African, and we get to dive into that quite a bit. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this chat with Jono Marcus of Copper and King's. I was, I was, <laughs> oh my goodness, please. Yeah, I mean, they're more famous in America than they are in Thailand. Oh, yeah. I can okay. tell you that. Hands down. You guys can't stand them there, can no. you? We no. can hardly stand them And there. you know, they were kicked off that movie set. Oh, were they really? Oh, yeah. They were kicked Chappie? off. Chappie? Was that Chappie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kicked off Chappie. They were so hard to handle. Um, but uh, I, would, I would say sports stars first. Then, yeah. you know, obviously maybe some one or two movie stars. Sholto Copley. Oh, yeah. Who's in the 18? I like him a lot. Yeah, I, I think he's, he's got really a really good. cool career. He was, uh, what's the one with Matt Damon he was in? It was really good. That was the uh, Elysium. That's right. Yeah. It was Escape. It was something like Elysium or something like that. It was that. Elysium, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was great in that. But, but, I actually just saw him in Hardcore Henry. Have you seen that? Uh uh-uh. uh. No, I heard about it. It's good. Actually, really good. All first person, right? Yeah. Crazy. Like, shot from point of view. It was amazing. How is it growing up then in South Africa? Like, because we probably perceive it completely different yeah. than it is. I think, you know, and. and <sighs> It's funny because people obviously look at me and they say, look at me, I'm, I'm Caucasian. And they're like, how do you, how do you really, you're from South Africa? I'm like, yes, believe it or not, there are white people. Yeah, I've heard South that. Africa, you know, the, the Dutch founded South <laughs> Kenya Africa. Kenya is a little different maybe, but yeah. South Africa. The Dutch founded, uh, they say they founded it. But I mean, the Dutch, you know, came and landed on our shores many, many moons ago in the 1600s. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, not to go history because I'm not a historian, but mm. I had a great upbringing, like phenomenal upbringing. There is nothing that I can fault. Um, w- was I aware of apartheid at the time? Yes, I was. Mm-hmm. Um, but not to the bad extent that I think a lot of the media shows. Like, I didn't see that side of it, thank goodness. Um, I think my parents protected me as much as possible. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I grew up not knowing that. So a lot of people think you're a white South African, you're inherently you racist, know, right? sure. or your parents were racist, and you did these horrible things to you know, the, the black people. And I'm like, oh, no, we, we didn't have any of that, you know? Right. We're just coexisting, We right? coexisted. Yeah. You know, some of my really good friends now are black people. And I'm like, it was a fantastic upbringing. And, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela was really one of those, um, you know, presidents of our country who just brought the nation together. And yeah. Kind of like the term, the rainbow nation for South Africa came about. Amazing. Because of him. And, um, you know, he was just this great un- unifier. Could, could you feel that as a kid? Oh, too? totally. Yeah. Totally. That there's this guy that's got so much power. Oh my God, like, I looked you know. up to him like one of my biggest things in life, I wanted to shake his hand and I never got to do it. Oh, man. I saw him live once um, and you know, he was actually just watching a rugby game and no I saw kidding. him. And um, yeah, it was like, I just wanted to shake his hand because you know, when you're around someone like that who can be so forgiving about yeah. things that happened to him in the past and then bring a country together. Um, that's an amazing trait. Absolutely. Because incredible. it takes... That's a very benevolent endeavor, right? So flip it, and that's what we're experiencing now in the States. Like We won't, we won't, we won't even mention who it is, right? <laughs> but it takes a talent to be that big of a dick. Oh, yeah. As it does takes that much of talent to be as great of a person. Great, humble, um, yeah, all of yeah. that. I, that's, a, that's one of the things. we don't. I don't know that we've felt that in a long time. 
in the states you know yeah someone really unifying it feels like we've only just kind of kept separating not by racial means, yeah but by political ones it's very very interesting yeah and I, I also always remember this i mean it was it was 94 when he became president and in 1995 we had the rugby world cup oh, yeah. which happened in south africa so you had this huge transformation in the country and then you had this world um looking on you for this big you know sports spectacle yeah and we ended up winning that world cup and i was like i can't believe how fortuitous this can be you know yeah. a new president trying to bring a country together the country then winning a world cup which again like unifies people even more yeah. i mean it was just like that's an amazing time to be the alive. gods were smiling on us you yeah. know is that invictus is that the movie that's about correct that? yeah it's a yeah. great movie too Clint yeah. Eastwood, I think, that one, but what kinds of things were you doing then as a, as a kid in south africa at were that you... time at that time i was just finishing up high school so i was playing rugby at that stage yeah and finishing up high school which was to me just about rugby it wasn't about the education part of it at right all. <laughs> the brute force <laughs> yeah it was like uh, yeah it been was, in a fight or two um no <laughs> my mom didn't my mom wouldn't like me to tell me that <laughs> so this is the the dream there in south africa is similar to how it is in the states where you got to go to college man you got to get a degree is it the same <sighs> my gosh i tell you i've spoken about this more recently than ever before about really? just kind of yeah just because i'm always reflecting i think also getting to that age of 40 or maybe just looking back and saying like you know, in school, when I was in high school, if you didn't study math, science, biology, uh -huh. you were going nowhere with your life. Really? Like, nowhere. So this immense pressure on you to take those subjects that, you know, were just totally nonsensical to me, to be honest with you. Like, for me to learn the reproductive system of a locust, <laughs> I, I, you know, I was like, how is this going to help me in life, you <laughs> I'm know? I'm drinking brandy right now. How the fuck does that feel? Exactly. <laughs> I was like, all I want to do is, you know, play rugby and drink like, yeah is it really why do i need to and women stuff? right it's always the women can, can i say that yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's always alternative motive it's um so yeah i mean i look back at that education system and just being totally pressurized to take these subjects because if you didn't take those subjects you wouldn't be able to get into a good university yeah. um so yeah my whole uh, process of going through higher education was from high school into to university was just like really based on peer pressure i can say right. nothing else you know or just you know was stereotypical of what everyone was doing and nobody was questioning anything about it right. you know and i remember having this conversation with my father when i was like i'm sitting there i actually took a year out of high school to go play rugby overseas where um, uh, where'd you go i played in england for a while and actually went to toronto and played oh, a little bit in toronto cool. in canada um and then coming back um I, I, you know, I had to study something because again, you know, what was I going to do with my life right. and had the conversation with my father. And I was like, what do I study? And he's like, we'll study this because it's just a general program and we'll figure it out after that. You That's know? right. Yeah. I guess like the things like career guidance didn't quite exist you know, <laughs> when I was growing up. Or... I don't know that I had it either. Like really? My folks. Well, so my mom, she, she was in nursing school and okay. she knew I didn't want to be a nurse. So then what she can tell me, right? Yeah. Like, get a business degree okay but you have a nursing degree what do you know about a business yeah. degree not that she's not great at business whatever but then and then being a single mom for for so long like until my parents the current inception got married in 88 i didn't have a lot of like you know do business actually my dad told me straight up when i was about wrapping my undergraduate degree oh, he's yeah. like psychology's not gonna work you know I'm like <laughs> fuck yeah you're probably right <laughs> like business might make more sense yeah for the same reason though we'll yeah. think about what to do with it after exactly right it doesn't i couldn't tell you if it if i've ever even used that degree no. or anything i mean get me in the door sometimes. yeah but that's about it yeah totally i think it's such a you know it's such a blanket um you know what's the word uh clause that a lot of companies right. put on people like if you don't have a degree sure you're not going to be hired you know we can't even look at you that's you know? right yeah um, and that's really really fallacious thinking because some of these fuckers with degrees are really pointless like they've got no experience no, you know what I mean? and then you got the guy that's been working construction his whole life that could run a project for, for tens of millions of dollars. Absolutely, you know what I mean. So it's it's so strange, and it's like that here. And I guess is it's still pretty traditional in the sense, though, in South Africa, like you need to have the the trilogy, the math, and the yeah, you you do. You, I, I look, I don't know how things have changed now. You know, I'm so far removed from that whole system, and I, you know, I finished school a long time ago. I <laughs> yeah. hope to God it's changed. Yeah, you know, and I I always had actually studied life coaching at one stage because i wanted to go back 
to those kids in high school that you know that Jono back in high school and say, <laughs> "Hey, listen, there's more to it than math, science, and biology. Trust right. me. You know, um, I'm a prime example of where you know life can take you. You know, and really, it's can take you anywhere that you're willing to let it take you. Right. You know? As long as you're not, as long as you're open, you can do, go anywhere. Absolutely. But that's you know? the difference. I think a lot of people are so closed off to change. They're afraid of what might be different. You know. Completely. I, I must say, like you just you just made me remember one point, like. I don't know what it was about growing up in South Africa, though, but you typically find South Africans to be extremely adventurous. Really? Absolutely. Like, travel a lot, try to work in other countries. You know, being a British uh, colony, Commonwealth at one stage, um, part of that, we were allowed to work, get a two-year work visa in England. And most of us ended up doing that. Oh, that's amazing, yeah. So, you know, at any one point in time, I remember people saying you could find a million South Africans just in England alone, you know. I had no idea. Um, so we took advantage of that. And so I, I find South Africans generally to be very outgoing, inquisitive, always questioning why, you yeah. know, why this way, why that but way. But probably not in a, like, a dick way. Not like, at all. Just because they're, they're, they want to have yeah. some sense of uh, understanding of the world. And, right? you know, to be honest, we, we grew up, Growing up in apartheid, you had restrictions from the outside world, you know, like there were sanctions against us, you know, so um, we didn't get a lot of movies and a lot of big bands coming and, you know, like, so we grew up sheltered from the outside world from that perspective, I think. So I think it inherently bred some real, you know, intriguing individuals who are like, what else is out there, you know? Really, truly examining life. Exactly. That's a bro, but that's... That is a, the, the perfect incubator for innovation, if you think about it. Well, so, I mean, you're just, you just gave me goosebumps there because you talk about that and, you know, immediately springs to mind, oh, like Elon Musk, you know. Yeah. So oh, is he South this, African? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, you have a guy like him. Um, you know, you have Dave Matthews, great musician. Who yeah. Born in South Africa. But, you know, going from the business end, there are a lot of South African businessmen here in, in, in America that are so below the radar, but they're doing the most fantastic things because they come in with a just completely different mindset. You know, sure. even though we speak English, our culture and, and upbringing is that so is, different yeah. that we we definitely um, we challenge the convention. You know, that's a brilliant. I, I, I love thinking about that. We're yeah. so stuck in Western way of thinking so many times, and and no, an app's not the solution. We're designing an app's not changing the way that we interact with each other really you know what I mean? and so we're so tech forward that we're kind of taking the human element out of it but it sounds like because technology even though you know it's not a third world country by any means but people no. might think that like they don't they still don't have like the kind of uh, technology that we have here like in terms of computers and stuff i mean it, it hits here first it always does yeah but the, so but the again it, that mind it, questioning approaching things differently having a different yeah. process results in beautiful things you know i think about um the banking systems in america i mean oh gee <laughs> you know south african banking systems make america look like they were designed by a kid and garden kid <laughs> that's how advanced our banking is in, yeah in south really africa. oh my god it is heads and tails above you guys it's scary yeah you know and so coming here <laughs> coming you know as i don't a, want to give you my money what are you talking as about? a south african coming here i was expecting these things and i was like are you kidding i'm going back to writing checks i was like are, are you joking yeah i can't do it you know an eft you know yeah, i can't yeah. e- electronically send you money no 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 we can't do that from bank to bank i was like no this is ridiculous and they, you, know? you know it's funny it's like elon musk doing paypal yeah so it makes perfect sense there you go i'm gonna bring it in so before we talk about, because I'm really interested in how you made your way to the States. Yeah. We're drinking what you guys call the flagship Copper and Kings brandy. It's at 45%. You said that it's five years being the youngest, but anywhere up to 13 years. Correct. Bl- blended brandies. Is, and you know, it's really nice. Like The finish on this is really, really crisp to me. How, how do you feel about, like, what's the... How do you describe this particular skew to people? Yeah, so, you know, American craft grape for us um, is really, you know, when I sit down in front of, you know, a retailer or a bartender, I'm like, this is what we as a company want to show you that what we created, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, This is our vision for American brandy. And and I said this to you earlier, but we're very influenced by American whiskey. So we've taken three grape varietals, um, Chenin Blanc, Colombard, and Muscat, blend those together, you know, and we come out with a brandy that is 
just absolutely elegant from those grapes. But again, we put it into a once used bourbon barrel. Yeah. So now that is bringing a whole nother angle to brandy because typically brandy is just aged in a new American oak barrel. Right. Or in, if it's in France, it's a cognac, you know, limousine barrel. Um, you know, but we put it in that one used bourbon barrel to bring out some of those whiskey tonalities into into the distillate. Yeah, because well, real quick, yeah. something I've noticed is the the fuminess of that you get with grape distillates. It's, it's so subdued here. Yeah, I'm getting the darker, more leathery, which again, paying homage to the to the whiskey, like it, it's that kind of earthy and root, rootiness. You know, not root, but in the sense like it's connected to the earth more than it is that punch of the alcohol, which is, was kind of blowing me away at 45. I would figure most brandies I've had at that, they're just, you know, like absolutely very, very fumy. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it really is a beautiful spirit. It's, it's delicate. I, I believe it gives you some spikes on the palate that are, you know, you associate with whiskey, but yeah. the finish is just nice, long, smooth finish. And, you know, we're sipping out it on the rocks, but I mean, you can, you know, put in any sort of cocktail. Oh, yeah. That is beautifully. Just a little bit of citrus. I mean, there's plenty, there's, Plenty of classic brandy. Oh, classic yeah. brandy cocktails from sidecars to... Oh, yeah. You know, just sad. Because this is... And, you know, I, I don't know that... I think masculine's going too far, but it is very much a more brooding version of a brandy. You you know what I mean? Because it feels... It just feels more cerebral to me drinking this. There's so much going on. Yeah. And a lot of it from the wood. Yeah. I, I think what Al's also... And I think when you compare it with a, with a cognac, I think Al's just has a lot of body and soul. Yeah. Uh, to me, cognac, you know, sometimes flat, you know, kind of soft on the palate. It really does, yeah. And just flattens out really quickly. But that aging process that we're using is really just bringing a whole different element to it and bringing, as I say, giving life to it, you know. Yeah, very new. It's very delicious. And we have two others, too, which is going to be brilliant to go through oh, yeah. this flight with you. Oh, yeah. I hope, I hope I, don't, I don't start speaking another language. <laughs> <laughs> get too tipsy. Well, I'll tell you what, you just get one from me. So. <laughs> Regrettably, regrettably. So the next kind of piece of the voyage or chapter for you, is it moving to the States or is there some other piece in between? between yeah. South Africa and I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to bore you with a lot of details of, of, of what happened in South Africa. I mean, Africa, it's but, pretty riveting already, man. But I, I guess, you know, my, my career was definitely influenced just by people. Yeah. You know, it was like, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I wasn't going to be, end up being a professional rugby player for a variety of reasons. Um, and my career just went from working in a family business, which was a private university. Oh, really? Yeah. What, what were you doing with the university? So my, my father started a private university, and I was basically a relationship manager. So we'd sell business-to-business programs, customize those programs for that corporate. Yeah. So they get a more, um, you know, an education that's slanted to the benefit of the company because they're paying for it. Right. As opposed to being a, just a generalized program where the individual, you know, reaps the rewards. Interesting. That makes sense. Well, it, you do, you're deeply intellectual. Like, and I'm not trying to flatter you, but like, I can tell you come from a place where you're surrounded by smart people. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just try and absorb as much as they tell me. That's you know? all it takes. Right? I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> just ask the questions. Just be around. It. So, what did, did that parlay into? You're like, all right, I think I'm maybe developing a career of my own in this particular. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, that was working for family is, if you've ever done it, is, is a challenge unto itself because yeah. family kind of separates, you know, and the lines between family and business to- t- totally disappear and you mm-hmm. end up talking about business and that's it. Um, so I got to a stage where I was had enough. We, I'd grown the business with my dad to a, a really good level. That I was happy that I'd done some great things and yeah. achieved certain things, and I was looking for the next, <laughs> the next move. And again, not knowing what the hell I <laughs> wanted to do. And I mean, this is going to sound crazy. But I mean, so I lived in an apartment complex, and one of the one of my neighbors worked for this big investment bank. Mm-hmm. And I literally bumped into her one time, and I was like, "Hey, got any jobs at the bank going?" She goes, <laughs> "Funnily enough, we do actually." Sent in my resume five days later, they employed me. That's so crazy. I went from higher education, from a private university to, to an investment bank. <laughs> I mean, just like polar, you know, opposites. Yeah. And was it even that interesting to you? You just wanted a job. It, I don't even know what <laughs> intrigued me about it because it was totally against my personality. It was a suit and tie place. Yeah. And I was basically a personal banker to very wealthy people. Right. So I had 300 clients. And uh, I'd have to look after their transactional banking needs. If they wanted to buy a new mansion, they want to buy a new Ferrari, 
whatever they wanted, yeah. I helped with them to facilitate that that transaction. And um, I, I think I learned a lot of great things about that place, especially about customer service. Right. Um, but does that really like fulfilling some soulful piece? Of oh, it? no. No. It's no. Not. I mean, I, there's a classic time where a buddy of mine who now works in radio, funnily enough, <laughs> but um, him and I were sitting next to each other because they literally try and stack you into these buildings like you're in that movie boiler room you know oh, like yeah, you're on yeah, a trading yeah. floor right which is you know totally bizarre because how do you meant to have a good conversation with a client when you well, got your you can't even hear him you, yeah exactly you know talking to his girlfriend and next door you know but i remember one time tapping him on the shoulder and just saying andrew stop right now and just look around and we both paused and for about 10 15 seconds we just started swiveling in our chairs just going around uh-huh. and i came back to him i said andrew dude we're in the matrix. <laughs> and it was one of those feelings that I was like, this is, this is insane. Two and a half years of my life had gone by pretty damn quickly. Right. And I was like, buddy, we got to get out of here. This is not, not healthy for us. And this is not a place where we want to be, you know? Um, and I resigned and he followed like, I think two or three weeks later, you oh, know? Right. Yeah. And so actually a bunch of my buddies all resigned at the same time from that place. But just an absurd kind of career change for me to go from this higher education family business to banking, which was totally not That's in crazy. line with me. But, you know, I think you, you know, you'll see when we come around, it's like just this theme of where my career has taken me has always been centered around this relationship management yeah. type of thing. People. You know, people. It's about people. Connecting with people, you know, yeah. having those social skills to be able to connect with people, whether you're, you're an absolute gazillionaire or you're a you know, guy on the street who can barely rub two pennies together. The thing that's really important about that and is in this industry, sometimes the priorities get mixed up a little bit. We're, even, even me, on the producer end, right? Yeah. It's about making things that people can embrace and people really enjoy. We make them for that, for the public, right? You make drinks, you make a menu for your customers, not because you're trying to be an egoist. Yep not a pissing contest yep. of who's smarter you know and i think that that's something that humility and that sense of it doesn't matter how much money you have it doesn't matter your status everybody has a fucking story and everybody oh, yeah. is interesting in some aspect you know so i can't even imagine where you head to next are you venturing to the states at this point or? yeah so so my time at the bank i i i'd always wanted to live in america and i had a six month uh, <laughs> you'll laugh at this. A six-month summer camp experience really? in America. Yes, yeah, so I was living in England at the time, um, and decided that I was working for a recruitment agency. They bored out of my brain again, wearing a suit and tie. And a buddy next to me, I said, "Let's let's let's go to America. Let's do a summer camp, man." You know? <laughs> Wait, working at a summer yeah. camp? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> American girls will love our accent, you know. <laughs> we'll score big time. That's, you're totally right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it was also quite insane. So, we did a six month stint uh, in America, loved it, had a where great the, time. Where was the camp? Boca Raton, Florida. Boca Raton. Well, no young people there. Yeah, so no. So, so, we had to travel, which was awesome. Yeah. But, you know, going down to Miami or you know, Fort Lauderdale, wherever it may be. Um, but then we did a huge road trip as well. So, we saw, saw a lot of America. Um, but I was always intrigued with America from a young age. I think I must have been about 16. I really started to remember thinking a lot about America. Mm-hmm. We had someone talk to us about, you know, sports scholarships in America. Right. And, you know, we're just like, wow, these universities are so big and there's money and you can actually become a professional sportsman and earn a lot of cash. And I was like, so I was always been intrigued about America. And so when I was sitting at the bank one day, decided to enter this thing called the green card lottery, ah. which not a lot of people know. And if you speak to some person in a small town, they'll think you're absolutely insane. So how, yeah, no, tell me more about this. I've heard about this, but I don't know so, what, how many people are able to get a green card. Yeah, so it's called the diversity lottery visa. And essentially, it's as easy as going online between, I think it's like the end of October and beginning of November. Okay. There's like a week window period where you go online, put in your details, and they'll let you know if you win or not. And obviously, you go through a huge vetting process right. afterwards. But I entered, I believe it was 2009, if I remember correctly. And lo and behold, I get a call and they're like, well done, you made it through to the next round. So, oh, that's brilliant. You know. Um, and you, you still were able to be in the States, right? So like you had a visa that, or had you? 
No, no, I was, I was, this is now in South Africa. I oh, was okay. in South Africa when this happened, when I entered and uh, I was at the bank. Uh, so, yeah, they give you, so basically you go through the whole vetting process. You know, they want to interview you at the embassy in, in Johannesburg in South Africa. And uh, yeah, stamp your passport and they say, congratulations, you've got six months to move to America. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I was newly married um, and, uh, you know, said to my wife, uh, what yeah, is she thinking? Do you want to go to America? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, six months is not a long time to kind of pack up your life and, and move to another country. Absolutely not. Was she, um, how, was she warm to the idea? She was. Yeah. She also, you know, liked America um, and, you know, I think loved me enough to say that let's go on an adventure together, you know. That's amazing. So we all packed up and uh, got to America in, in March of, of 2012. And uh, to start our new life That's pretty recently. I didn't, you know, you seem like so firmly affixed to the the social element of the scene and stuff. Like, that's not that long ago. No, it's not long. It's and it's been a a crazy journey. It isn't. It isn't long at all. You know, when I think back to it, it's like wow, that that isn't long. March 2012, and um, yeah, and arriving with no job. That was, uh, you know. But you were able to do it via that lottery because otherwise you couldn't just come in with correct a america is the hardest country to get into really legally uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's literally quite easy to jump into yeah. I suppose. no it really is and you know i think if i remember last time i saw an article there were probably about eighty thousand south africans in america total total do you know which, where mostly which cities are really big for yeah there are actually quite a few in texas um san diego is quite a hub um Florida to a certain state, quite a few in, in Atlanta. Really? We have these pockets all over the place, but um, surprisingly quite a few in Texas. That's interesting. Yeah. So you can, if you arrive and you move to a neighborhood with a lot of South Africans, do you at least have some brothers in arms, like immediately? Ah. Uh, Does it work like that? Because in the States. Don't let, don't let me go down this road. Because <laughs> you know I've, it's not like that for us in the States. Like if I go to move to California. No. Just another white dude moving to California. So we were very fortunate that we, my best friend had recently just got a job in LA. Oh, okay. So he had moved there with his family. He was working for an advertising ag- agency there. And so we had a soft landing in terms of a place to stay at least. Yeah. Um, that helped us to kind of get up, get our feet on the ground and also for me to start applying for jobs. Um, but Do you, ha- you have any preconceived notion about what LA was like before going there? Uh, no, I mean, I'd been there in... 2003 i think it was on some of my travels but no i had no idea i had no idea i mean just the allure of the beach and everything mm-hmm. i was kind of like this is amazing this is la uh, and the fact that my best friend was there and uh was like i want to try and be here you know what well, at least gives you some kind of support yeah. system with your wife you know? well my other best friend was in chicago at the time and i was like well that weather would absolutely kill me <laughs> so i'll take the la weather Does it never get that cold in south africa no, no never right my god no it's too because it's uh, close to the equator Ish. um it's fairly close to the equator yeah. i mean uh, I, I think i had this argument with somewhere america's close to the equator than than uh, we are Is it that true? yeah okay, okay. so our, our, our temperatures are very moderate like we don't get as hot as texas at all i would say that california is south african weather totally perfect then. yeah so you you go into la you're gonna be a movie star you ever contemplate that <laughs> <laughs> contemplate that you got some appeal you get the i've got a really cool story about that really can't tell you a cool story Please, yeah so jobless uh, sitting on the beach in Santa Monica and a cu- couple guys are playing some rugby on the beach. So I went over there and started chatting to some guys. And this guy sat down next to me who wasn't playing and we were just chatting and turned out that he was in the movie business. Hmm. Uh, I didn't really ask him much more than that, you know, but a couple probing questions and I kind of figured out his name and surname and currently went home after that and looked up his you know, profile on IMDb. Okay. Lo and behold, this guy is one of the best stunt directors in Hollywood. Oh, no The South African kid. Really? Yeah. I say kid. I mean, he's, he's not a kid. But <laughs> he, um, yeah, so, you know, big action-packed movies, like from Tom Cruise to, you know, Brad Pitt, you name it, he's done it all. Really? Um, so I sent this guy an email. I was like, listen, I don't have a job. I'd, I'd also done two movies in South Africa doing some really low-level stunt work. Were you like a grip or something? Oh, you did stunt I, stuff. I did some stunt work as well. Really? Like just the rugby stuff. had prepared you, hadn't it? Exactly. <laughs> kind of to take some heavy knocks. Um, so, you know, I emailed this guy and I was like, 
hey, I did two movies in South Africa. <laughs> you know, can you help a brother out, you know? Yeah. Met him for coffee the next day. This guy rolls up in his uh, Land Rover Sport. So yeah. clearly making a lot of money. Got a beautiful house in uh, Marina del Rey. Not struggling at all. Yeah. And I bought him a cup of coffee. because What? Yeah. Oh, he, just. He didn't want to. Didn't, didn't even reach for his wallet. And really? I was like, hey, I did ask you for coffee, so I'll take you That's for coffee. Fair, yeah, and didn't even throw me the slightest bone to help me out. Really? Why did he meet with you then? I don't know. Just I, to not do anything? I honestly don't know. Like, I asked him a lot of questions, and, you know, I was kind of not being that guy who was begging mm -hmm. for help, you know, but I needed a break. And, you know, you asked me earlier about the South African community. It really isn't like that. It's a very weird thing that South Africans in America... I believe have struggled so hard yeah. to get themselves set up here that they almost like screw you, new guy. It's like a dog, two dogs going for one bowl kind of thing. Almost like that, yeah. or like I've paid my dues, you need to pay your dues oh, I see, now. I see, you know, okay. like we've struggled, you need to struggle. You need to figure out how tough it really is. You know. Wow. Um, so yeah, that was a kind of a funny story, and you know, he he he's gone on to do some crazy movies, and every time I see his name in the credits, I'm like. <laughs> Dude, you could have hired me to do something. <laughs> Carry your bags. I look or... like Brad Pitt, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So let's, this is good. I like this LA story, so to speak. And we have the second one to try here. We'll grab some ice. And tell me about the, the immature, this is the apple brandy, right? Yeah, this is the unaged apple brandy, Michigan apples. Uh, so we press the, the fruits out in Michigan bring it down to Kentucky and we make the low wine and we distill that twice. So, you know, like all our products, double distilled, non chill filtered, um, really trying to uh, retain as much of the nuances of those fruits as possible. And this is just very light, bright, unaged apple brandy. All our products unadulterated, so we don't add anything post distillation. There's no Caramel coloring, sugar, anything like that to any of our products. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, when you look at the Apple brandy category, there's not a lot going on. Lairds have basically had the market for many, 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 many years. Right. And done a fantastic job at it. And we were like, hey, we can also get involved in this. Well, I hear, I hear that they're not as interested in being what they are anymore. It's, there's been some changes in hands and stuff. I, if I understand correctly. So, I mean, there's there's a good opportunity to revitalize something that is already here, you know? Oh, absolutely. Um, and we do also have an aged product, uh, which is coming out in uh, probably late September. We'll come out with our aged apple brandy, which has been again sitting in a once-used bourbon barrel. Yeah. But then we'll finish that off in a Oloroso sherry cask oh, for brilliant. about eight months. So it definitely has some of those sherry notes to it. 100 proof apple brandy is exactly what you what the bartenders want. Yeah. Coming to those full cocktails. Jack Rose cocktail, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Famous Jack Rose cocktail. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's an amazing thing. And just the nose on this is pretty it's insane. Yeah. This I just smell just a ton of cinnamon and apple and mm. as I say, just light bright. This is also 90 proof. Um but but again, none of that real punchy scent. Which no. you get from the younger kind of fruit brandies. No, I mean, for an eau de vie, I think this is absolutely spectacular. I mean, even our immature grape brandy is yeah. as fantastic at this. Just, as, you know. man, like, I could put an egg white in this and a little bit of sugar. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Great. absolutely. And the, uh, you know, again, something, that, you know, white spirits being versatile to the bartenders out there. Yeah. They look at it and they think, okay, I can play around with this a lot, you know, more easily than maybe another spirit. You know? How is pricing on this stuff? Do you find it has to be pretty competitive? Yes, from a we we definitely didn't outprice ourselves. You know, I think when you look at a lot of craft distilleries out there, um, we've seen the guys put heavy price tags on it because yeah. they're you know it says craft on it, so we can charge a fortune for it. Right. And we didn't go want to go down that road. You know, we want the volume out of this. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> you know, you want to make money. And so when we looked at the pricing structure, we made sure that the pour cost for the especially for the on premise made sense. Yeah. That it didn't blow out their margins at all. So what a what for, for the staple or the flagship grape apple or grape brandy how what's retail so your retail on that will be at 32.99 that's a very reasonable yeah. bottle yeah and at 45 too which is great again i really applaud you guys for doing a 90 proof thank you yeah. and then the the lesser age or the the apple immature apple you'll get for about a 27 28 oh, that's 99 great too. yeah it's yeah. really reasonable yeah and you guys are through republic here 
Uh, Glazers. Glazers thank Southern you. Glazers, excuse me. No. Yeah, the the massive that only could be this big in America kind of distributor. <laughs> That's yeah. Please don't, <laughs> please don't make me talk about Glazers. No, I, <laughs> I absolutely won't. I'll I'll talk about. It. <laughs> so when did you get your footing then in LA? Did that happen for you? No, it didn't. I struggled. Four months. I had no job. Um, we ran out of money. And uh, I remember a very intimate moment with my wife on the beach uh, in Santa Monica. And I just looked at her. She was sitting on a rock and I was standing on the beach. And I said to her, I don't think we can survive. We probably need to go home. Um, I had one card left to pull. Yeah. Um, my very good friend that I mentioned earlier in Chicago was working for Miller Coors. Mm-hmm. And I had never thought about getting into the beverage industry. But I was so desperate for a job that I just thought I'd reach out to him. Um, he was looking after Peroni at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, so he was, you know, fairly well established in Chicago. I think he'd been there, you know, just over a year or so already and, uh, sent him my resume and lo and behold, um, it was a very interesting period where Miller Coors had just purchased Crispin Cider, Mm -hmm. but Crispin Cider hadn't yet folded into the whole uh, Miller Coors house yet. So in fact, Crispin Cider was looking for somebody up in Washington. Oh, really? Washington State. So that's where the job was at. Um, it was funny enough, though, there was a job going in L.A., but the guy didn't want me in L.A., um, but the guy in, in Washington wanted me. And uh, What, So because they think your personality is a better fit for the Pacific Northwest? Or what? Funny, I, you know, I never asked him why he ended up hiring somebody else who turned out to be an absolute disaster, so I always <laughs> laugh, laugh at him for that. Yeah. Um, it would have been great to have been able to stay in L.A. and be with my, with my best friend. But, you know, it just so happened that, you know, we weren't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. And I was sure. like, Washington is. And uh, I'll never forget my my first boss, uh, Jeff Anderson. You know, he, he didn't even look at my resume. I arrived in Sacramento. That's where he interviewed me. And uh, he took me out to lunch. We then went. Did to he have, pay? He did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. And then he took me for a coffee. And we then went to the airport together because he was flying back to Washington. Yeah. And I was flying back to Santa Monica. And um, he said to me, you need a break, don't you? I was like, you have no idea. He says, I'm going to give you that break that you need. I mean, this is verbatim, the conversation. Wow. He was like, you need a break. And I was like, absolutely. And uh, he said, you got the job. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was, I was even cheeky enough to ask for more money when they, <laughs> <laughs> when they, when they told me how much they were going to pay me. Yeah. But, they shipped us up to to Washington State, and I was at that stage. So it was with Crispin Cider, and I was looking after Washington and Oregon for Crispin oh, Cider. That's a beautiful area. Absolutely spectacular. We're in uh, Washington. Where you living? So just outside of Seattle. Oh, perfect. Yeah, just outside of Seattle. That's got to be a t- terroir, so uh, to call it by that name, that you hadn't seen before. I imagine because it's uh, it's all green and lush and forest. Yeah, and uh, you know the rain was uh, was kind of an unknown factor yeah. for sure. Um, you know, we weren't aware of how bad the rain was. Right. Um, and having lived in London for, for a little bit of time, you know, I, I knew that it wasn't quite, wasn't quite what I liked, but you know, I'm very London esque, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. You know, and you can go seven days with just constant rain up there and, uh, in Seattle and Washington and it's pretty brutal. Yeah. But it was a, you know, it was a lot of, uh, you know, fall down, you know, bump your head, get back up again type story and and a, a huge learning curve for me because, as I landed in, in Seattle, and this is no joke, two weeks after getting there, my boss resigned. Oh, shit. The guy that fought The guy that fought to me, break. gave me the break, oh, left. No. And um, I had never worked in the industry. I didn't know about this three-tier system that was in place yeah. and had to figure this all out on my own. So it really was a sink or swim. Uh, luckily, I had a really good guy at the distributor who basically held my hand and told me what I should be doing because otherwise... I really would have no idea, right. especially talking about the distributor management part of it. Yeah. You know? Going out and seeing accounts is one thing, but actually having that uh, that knowledge of the inner workings of a distributor was is a vital piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. You know? So yeah, and and so for a few months, I looked after those two states for the company, and it was a you know, Crispin cider was cider as a category was just huge, growing, booming, right, at an unbelievable rate. You know, so I came in there looking like an absolute rock star. You know, but it was an easy product to sell. Yeah, did you did you find a lot of interest? Because I always akin to most people that get into the, the industry, even if it's 
happenstance, you know. They have some kind of, their father worked as a chef or their mom was a waitress or something. Did you have any background in food or booze at all? Nothing. Nothing, right? Other than drinking it from a very young age. <laughs> did, did, they cr- did they crush ciders in South Africa? Did Strongbow? Crazy. Strong. <laughs> <laughs> Strongbow. There's a Savannah Dry Cider, which is probably a, a very popular one. We have a very sweet one called Hunter's. Hunter's, okay. Hunter's Gold is also. And Hunter's had this brilliant marketing. And I say brilliant because it spoke to me. It was all about extreme sports. Okay. So the, our biggest bungee jump in South Africa was sponsored by Hunter's Cider. Perfect. Know? So it was like, awesome, I'm going to support Hunter's. It's like Red Bull, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, um, gave me that superhero strength um, <laughs> to jump off a bridge. Or at least making you think you had yeah exactly strength. what i don't have it are you kidding <laughs> i mean you might you're rugged so, it's very it's very possible it's which is crazy to think of growing up drinking cider but then coming back full circle and also growing up drinking brandy really yeah oh my god south africa drinks a ton of brandy i didn't realize that yeah where does the grapes grow pretty much throughout yeah the western cape area we have really? beautiful vineyards out there um it's like napa on steroids really though wow huge mountains um in these beautiful valleys and we grow some fantastic grapes out there and make worldwide winning um brandies as yeah. well um, i didn't realize that i crazy. believe last year there's a south african brandy called odomolin mm-hmm. which won best in world last year so you know south africa being this tiny country wins world awards for its brandy it's pretty spectacular so it's in your dna it's so yeah somehow but, there right? but i mean you think about that you know and you think I grew up drinking these things, and now I'm actually selling them. It's just pretty weird. It's profound, you know, because it's, it's so it's so fortuitous. Yeah, that it could just even be like that. Like brandy. Oh yeah, I didn't even give it a second thought. No. And now you're peddling yeah, <laughs> some of gonna... the best American brandy, if yeah. not the best that there is. It's, it's. I mean, who would have thought? It's pretty crazy. Yeah. No, so I have a. My mother doesn't drink, and my father drinks, but you know, never. It wasn't a thing like he would say, hey, son, this is a good whiskey that you should try. Yeah. It was, you know, I totally grew up ignorant to this. You know, I had, I had a few friends who dabbled in the booze industry mm. in South Africa, but they were like promoters. So they would go out and force people to drink Jack Daniels and, you know. Right. Um, it's or, not a nuanced experience. No, right? no, no, not at all. So, yeah, it, it's just weird how you drink these things and now you're like, I actually sell them, you know. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, all right. So we've got, we, I think... More or less, we've arrived to the latest chapter with you and Copper and Kings, yeah? Yeah, I mean, after a short stint with Millicours selling, uh, you know, being folded into the big company and selling beer and looking after distributors in California, because we, we got shipped from Washington down to Northern California, mm-hmm. uh, East Bay, um, I then got the opportunity to, to join Copper and Kings. And it just so happens that the same guys who started Copper and Kings were the same guys who did Crisp and Cider. Are you kidding me? So we had that connection already. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Did you go to uh, often go to like the the production of the cider as part of kind of training for? The yeah, cider? I went. I went at least twice. Um, really? You know? Yeah. And uh, they know apples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So they. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was just so funny that they, they, you know, doing Christmas cider. Like, yeah, I knew you guys were going to do an apple brandy. It's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like yeah. real, not a huge jump. Not a huge jump. Yeah. But it, it's a completely different market was we were talking about oh, it's cider crazy. makes sense people get it people yeah. can drink it really nothing not a lot of legwork education no. wise but you talk about apple brandy or even just the larger category of brandy you mentioned people you went to a store and like you guys carry brandy like no it's like well, what about all the cognac that's back there you know yeah. so people don't get it no people don't get it um when you look at the numbers though of which spirits are growing like on a 52 week run you can see that you know and yes it's off a small base but consistently cognac slash brandy um is top three fastest growing categories um you know irish whiskey's tequila than typically brandy and cognac um so you know when the owner of the company joe heron who is an incredibly smart individual when he looks at categories he looks at what he calls the well-served paradigm and, okay. and this, I hope I can do him justice by explaining this. But he basically looks at a category and goes, well, you know, I'm going to put it in layman's terms. What does the competitor set look like? So mm-hmm. What competitors am I dealing with? And are they doing anything interesting in that category? Right. 
Um, so when he looked at cider, it was like, oh, there's Woodchuck and Hornsby, six pack uh, bottles, um, really sweet cider. Um, but no one had really pushed into the premium segment. Right. So he was like, great, premium's the way to go. So he did Crispin, four pack in a bottle, you mm-hmm. know, and, you know, charged a higher price. There's a premium, premium product, better tasting product, you know, made from fresh pressed apples, not from concentrate. Right. Had that whole slant in it. So, you know, skip a few years on and he looks at Brandy um, and he goes, wow, what is going on in Brandy? We have E&J, Corbell, Christian Brothers, Paul Masson, all these cheap domestic brandies that have a big market, don't get me wrong. And when you look at the premium segment, though, nothing There's no interesting is happening. There, there right? Yeah. And that's interesting that you say there isn't anybody there because there are guys there, but they're not making any noise. Right. So when he looked and he's like, there are a few guys on the West Coast. These guys have been around since the 1980s making some fantastic brandies, but they're not doing anything about it. Right. And this is where I think Joe and his marketing genius was like, all right, so there's not that many competitors. Let's get into their premium space. And with his background and experience, he's like, we're going to market the shit out of this you right. know, and do it right. Um, make and, some noise as you say. and make some yeah. noise and and you know do a great job of pr and, and produce a product that's for those bartenders who are very interested in classic cocktails and the history of brandy mm. um, which is something i would like to say about the history i mean i don't think a lot of people know about brandy in america i d- we don't so it, the, people from mexico know brandy that's all they drink yeah apparently exactly. not tequila but not brandy and oh my gosh i have so many conversations with people about that do they do mexicans drink more tequila or brandy no, everyone says tequila. It's like, mm, nah. no. Ask, ask Javier Flores. Yeah, it's, it's brandy. <laughs> it's brandy. It's totally brandy. brandy. So, um, you know, we, we had a great uh, bourbon historian. His name is Michael Veach, and he's based out of Kentucky and Louisville. And we had him start looking into brandy. Well, it turns out brandy was the first distilled spirit in this country. Is that right? 1640, Staten Island. There's the documentation. Apples. Of, yeah. yeah. More than likely apple brandy, it actually doesn't state it. Okay. Because that's um, apple country up in absolutely. New York. Absolutely. So we all assume that'll be apple brandy. Yeah. So that's a good... That's crazy though. That's a good eight years before rye whiskey. Yeah. And a good, what, hundred or so years before bourbon? Oh, yeah. So, Scots weren't even really here yet, were they? So, you know, there's this incredible history of brandy. I mean, at one stage in the late 1800s, there are over 400 brandy distilleries in Kentucky alone. Really? <laughs> In the late 1800s. That's incredible. I had no idea. Yeah. And so there's all this history. And, you know, Jerry Thomas, I'm sure you've read that book a thousand yeah. times, How to Mix Drinks. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's got a lot of brandy cocktails in there. I mean, brandy was around and around in a way that nobody knows about unless you want to dig up the archives, which mm. we did. We had to do to prove that the spirit was the first original spirit of this country. Yeah. And we're just trying to get that back. Well, know? how do you revitalize it? It's something that's like, it's like yeah. gin, right? Gin had this just an amazing, ubiquitous nature in cocktails, pre-prohibition. And then probably even up until the 50s, I'm sure plenty of people correct me, but then it shifted to a vodka realm. Yeah. And I hear there was a good reason for it because you want to come back from a three martini launch not smelling like it <laughs> right that's functional i get it right yeah very functional but it, but it's strange because it's it's coming back around but it's taken that it's a large ship to turn around for gent and how do you do it with brandy to be honest with you it's it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of pr it's a lot of marketing um you know we have invested the company's invested in putting feet on the streets to yeah. go out there and educate people but you know, we're trying to build this category first, getting people to, you know, not be scared of brandy. Mm-hmm. Because What know, is there to be scared about with I brandy? Think, you I think? think people have some bad experiences with it, with the cheap stuff. Yeah. And wake up with a really, really bad hangover. And, you know, we're trying to get people to think about our brandy as they think about a whiskey, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Finely we, crafted, aged with brilliant barrels. Correct. Yeah. All, all those things that you'd associate with a good whiskey you can find in our brandy and and you know people always ask me who are you, who's your target market who is it and i'm yeah. like yes we'd love to convert a cognac drinker don't get me wrong but we'd love it that's that's our tough but that's tough yeah you know, man. there's there's a lot of you know the the avenue that they've gone down with their marketing that's a tough market for us to go into i was like we want to get the whiskey drinker yeah 
you know, and it's amazing when you tell people, hey, it's aged in a once used bourbon barrel. Well, they, they, there's a shift in their mind mm-hmm. because there's a, some sort of fam- familiarity. I know bourbon. It. I know bourbon, yeah. I'm not scared of that. I'm not scared of bourbon and it's a great quality, right? Yeah. You know, they, they stick to certain regulations, don't they, of how they make it? Yes, they do. Um, so we, we, we really are trying to capture that variety-seeking whiskey consumer because all of us have gone to a bottle store or even seen someone in a liquor store and how they're shopping for their next favorite whiskey. Right. They don't know what they want on the day. No. They're either influenced by what they read in the magazine or what their friends have told them or what ad- advertisement on the radio, TV, whatever it may right, be. Right, right. But they go into these liquor stores and they're just browsing for the next thing. And there's no reason why they cannot pick up a good bottle of Copper and King's Brandy. Yeah. To sip on the rocks or make a cocktail, whatever they want to do, you know? You, you know what's funny? I and mean, as I was sipping the, the flagship, I was thinking, you know... If I didn't know better, I could say that that could be a whiskey. It's that, that, again, that dark and that rich and that kind of leathery even in some aspects, you yeah. know, just not grainy, right? But I think a lot of people probably couldn't even tell. No. Do you, are you the guy as well out there in the retail shops doing the sampling and such? Or do you guys have? No, we, we try to go down the route of employing other people just because I can't be everywhere. I oh, that's off, right. I look yeah. after four states, but that that just wasn't working for us. Extremely expensive exercise. And, you know, they obviously are not going to sell with the same passion that I'm going to sell with. So Yeah, you're outsourcing um, passion. Like, exactly. How do you do like, that? How do you yeah. do that, you know? That's and what it, I'm saying. Like, if you went and did it, yeah. like, I'll, so, what do you, I'll drink it. What do you got? I, I do all the time. I'm, I'm you know, between here and, and Dallas and Houston, I'm trying to do as many samplings as I can. Yeah. Uh, staff education uh, because, you know, I, I find that, you know, even just dinners, you know, brandy dinners where you're speaking to a group of people where you can then, you know, they can be your, your foot soldiers and go out there and spread yeah. the good word about brandy, you know. Um, you got to do a lot of that and it's constantly speaking to people and educating them and, and holding their hand really through yeah. the whole thing and saying it's not a scary thing, trust me, you know. Um, it isn't. It's, it's instantly familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's what we're trying to, you know, that's what we want to people yeah. to think. It's like, oh, okay, this is not that bad. And I can see myself sipping on the rocks, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, or enjoying in a cocktail with this. And you guys have expanded into, there's multiple other things here, too. And we have yeah. a bottle of the unfiltered, ultimately, cask strength brandy as well. Yeah. It's roughly 60-something, right? Yeah, we're at, we're, at, we're at 124 proof on this one. Brilliant, wow. Uh, this bottle came about by accident. Um the master one of the distillers was actually going to a competition and uh wanted to like throw some things together so he mixed a couple barrels together Mm. blended a few barrels and came up with this so essentially what we've done we've taken uh, a new american oak barrel um and then three of our bourbon barrels and we blended those together wow i get yeah i'm gonna try this yeah absolutely Yeah, we do a brandy-based absinthe, so we use our immature uh, muscat grape brandy for our base of our absinthe. But we are experimenting all the time. I think it's very important as a craft distillery and, you know, keeping our master distiller entertained and letting, <laughs> letting him be <laughs> the creative. The 40 under 40, right? Yeah, exactly. Was a wine enthusiast? Was... Yeah, yeah. Wine, yeah, he's a seventh-generation winemaker. And, uh, Does he play in an indie rock band? He looks like he might play uh, I, I think in, and... in his alternative life, he probably does. <laughs> I think he I wishes that, he does. Because it's like, you can tell which dudes are the brewers. Oh, yeah. You got the hats and they got a massive beard. You can tell the guys that play in Lucero. Yeah. For those of people who listen out there. But. Huge, music, huge music fan. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody in the company is a big music fan. Uh, That's not really a coincidence because music is, booze is music. If, yeah, you know? exactly. I think you're, you're 100% correct. And, uh, you know, we've taken that, that love of music and even started playing music to the barrels. So we... Uh, <laughs> ah. yeah, that's, I, they do that uh, for some tequilas as well, yeah. I understand. So we're, um, we, we keep our basement at an even temperature and we you know, play music with these big bow subwoofers in the yeah. basement. And we are playing music 24 hours a day constantly. What are you guys playing? Do you know? Every day it's different. So what's awesome is if you go onto our website, you actually can see what the barrels are I saw the playlist. To. Is, yeah. that, is that what that is? That gets updated every day. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, there was yeah. some chairlift on there. There's some cold play on there. You guys are really introducing... A lot of different movies. Oh, yeah. You know, really, it's we try and pick... If it's an artist's birthday, that's probably the best thing. Yeah. You know, like the other day was Michael Jackson's birthday. Awesome. They got to listen to Perfect. you. Perfect. 
Yeah, Michael Jackson the whole day. But you know, even if it's one of our birthdays at the who works for the company, we get to construct our own playlist on Spotify. What would you What would you pick? What are a couple of songs you'd pick? I think I, you know I, I went across the board. I actually introduced a few South African bands to the barrels. Really? Um, yeah, Prime Circle being one of them. Um, Johnny Clegg, a very famous South African musician. Mm-hmm. But then I went to like Lincoln Park, which is my all-time favorite. Really? Yeah, a little bit of Limp Bizkit. Yeah, it was stuff that would just it, it cause a little bit of disruption, exactly. which is what you're looking for. Exactly. Contact we, with. The- we're there to disrupt the market and <laughs> disrupt the distillates in the barrel, so it can keep swimming around there and touching it. If that's not a brilliant metaphor, I don't know what it is. So the last question I've I've got for you because we we've, we've went through really incredible the flagship brandy at forty five percent. Anywhere as young as five, as old to thirteen, or twelve to thirteen. With the two, is it under two age, two years, or two two years for the apple, the no, immature apple? This this comes straight, straight off, off the still, right? Straight, straight off the still, yeah. And it's lovely expression, just a natural expression of, of apples. So it just it harkens back to nature and makes me think of the fall. It's a perfect time to drink it. As Absolutely, we're yeah. Into September, and then this cast strength, which is still going to change the sip. I'll sip here in a second, but there's been a lot of talk about disruption. In the brand ambassador world lately, right? And we we talked, you know, three on two separate occasions we talked about the importance of education, especially in the brandy category. Obviously, it'd be very beneficial for the gin category as well. Absolutely. Right? And do you think that there's a chopping block and these brand ambassador jobs are on the line? Do you think this, if you had, if it was your choice, do you think this is the right thing to do? Do you think that cutting education is the best way to save money? Yeah. Um, no, of course not. I, I, I think it's such a vital piece of this business. I think, if anything, because there's new products coming out so frequently, um, and we spoke about this, that this business is not rocket science. It really is about relationships. Mm. You know? Um, it is just alcohol at the end of the day, you know, but those relationships are the things that can really help, um, you know, get on that next menu or, you know, get them to buy a barrel and, you know, you have to, your brand ambassadors are your extensions of your company, right? I mean, those are really the people that touch consumers, buyers on a daily basis, Right. right? They're out there feet on the ground. Yeah, you know? and I hate that term, feet on the street. It drives me crazy, and I but I always use it all the time. But it is, you know, and it's it it goes from that handshake to the like on Facebook. You know, my wife was irritated with me the other day because I was on Facebook. She's like, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I'm working." She goes, "How how are you working on how Facebook?" Is it? Right? Yeah. I was like, "Well, I can tell you this: this bartender from that bar, he's in Austin at the moment, and I'm trying to get to have a drink with him. And then another bartender is competing in a competition over there, so I'm sending him a good luck message." And it's this constant reminder about, yeah. oh, Jono from Copper and Kings, he sent me a message. He liked my photo. But he's also going to be at my competition to come and shake my hand and say hello. And, you know, it's it's that front of mind all the time, you know. It's the doing. Absolutely. You know, being social, being, it's the organic piece of it. Because I think sometimes you, you run a business and you think, oh, it's all digital, it's all digital because the overhead's so cheap. I'm already paying PR company. Yeah. Answer my emails. Let's just have them do Twitter and Facebook. But honestly, relationship building now, the currency is Facebook. The currency is Twitter. Like this is the way you yep. really build relationships. Now, it's kind of like modern dating in a sense. Like you don't take it you, it's more just like a real topical kind of light touch and social and then you go and you're like, "I'm going to go to the competition, then we'll see each other in person, we'll have a good chat." Yep. You know. It is essential to this industry, I think. And I'm looking forward to talking to more more people that do that. And I know Diageo's had a big problem with it. And, you know, on their P&L, I guess it wasn't making sense or something. Yeah, I mean, I see they're trying to do a whole lot of damage control now that they're just, you know, revisiting the program or reshaping yeah. it. I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I know that that caused a lot of problems. I mean, we read about articles for the next, you know, two weeks after that. Yeah. You know? The Our people be- that they were trying to serve with the program basically rebelled against Absolutely. them solving it. Yeah. Absolutely, you know. And... You know, when you, if, if I was ever to start my own uh, distillery, I mean, this is something that I would, you know, invest a lot of money into yeah. is, is having those, I would say, high touch points, you know, having those people who have the relationships or, or the ability to build those relationships at least 
um, because that is what this game is about to me personally. Yeah. That's what it's I about. I think you're that, right. I think you're absolutely you know, right. I, I had the prime example of a fantastic bartender in Arkansas, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Now, this guy, um, Sean Traxler, he has like over 6,000 followers, 6,500 followers on Instagram, which wow. is a lot. That is a lot. For a bartender who's in Fayetteville, yeah. Arkansas. And I know that I, at a drop of a text message or a phone call, I can have him, I can ask him to do a favor for me. Yeah. And that, that speaks volumes. And that's not, you know, to brag about me it's it's just to show you that this is about relationships that i don't have to be in faithful but i've built up that relationship over time we like each other he's a great guy yeah um we both have pit bulls so it makes it even better <laughs> um and you know i can ask him for a favor you know to to help me out and he's like yeah sure i'll help you out you know it goes back to it man i mean this cast strength is really what i, I always wanted exposure to this because you know even for calvados there's only like two available in America that are near cast strength. Yeah. You know, and this is even if it's below cast strength being above 60% to get that kind of introduction into this spirit unadulterated. Yeah. Because now I'm getting even more of that depth and the darkness of the wood. And then the, just the, the, the gentleness of the distillate. Again, you guys have really subdued the fuminess yeah. here. I, I always tell people that for me, the fact that the grapes, that fruit it just helps mellow it out. I, I yeah. always use that phrase. It just mellows it out. You know? Which it normally isn't the case. No. But in this case, it absolutely when does. When you're drinking a grain spirit of that sort of proof, I mean, you're you're gasping for air. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. this has pulled out a ton of sweetness out of those bourbon barrels. But then that new American oak barrel has brought some good spiciness to it as well. That baking, you know, soda kind of spice, mm -hmm. you know. Um, which, you know, if you're drinking a Booker's or a Baker's or any maker's car strength, whatever your you know poison is at that higher proof, there is no reason why you wouldn't enjoy this. This is, it's so akin. It's yeah. a certainly a parallel path flavor-wise. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, for me now, selling Butchertown brandy has been one of the easiest things to sell. Yeah. Because you, you go to those bartenders, most bartenders are already drinking high-proof spirits, and we're like, wow, this is incredible but they still need to help educate the consumer sure. about it, right? And, you know, to make a Manhattan with that Butcher Town brandy is absolutely phenomenal. It's perfect, yeah. And um, Bovardier would even be good. Absolutely. You know, you could you could do anything. And uh, they still have to help hold the hand of their consumer and say, it's okay, you can drink this brandy. You're going to be okay, you know? Well, I'll be okay, John. Yeah, you're, you're going to be okay. It's been brilliant chatting, man, and walking through these bottles. It gives me so much more connection to the how you, what you guys are doing and like really how great the juice is i was i didn't know i'm so glad i know now and thanks so much for sharing that yeah absolutely there's and there's some really fun things that we're doing i mean we've just aged an apple brandy in a tequila barrel oh wow um yeah we've a aging an absinthe in a uh, juniper barrel from serbia um we've we're coming out with something really cool next year it's called the geography series mm -hmm. we've imported brandy from south africa and we're blending it with our that brandy. Did you do that? that no, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You can't ever. You can take the boy from home. You can't take the home no. out of the belly. No. So yeah, we, we're we're doing like a, a blend of South African brandy and our brandy. Wow. It's called the Geography Series. So we're doing some really creative stuff, and you know we've we've uh, aged some of our brandy and once used uh, beer barrels where the guys have taken obviously that, yeah. an ex bourbon barrel, aged their beer in it. Now we're aging our brandy in it. So. Wow. We're constantly changing up, trying to get you know those craft beer consumers to come and try our brandy. Um, it's brilliant. But all fun stuff. You guys are doing great work, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing it, and thanks for chatting with me. Appreciate it. Thank you for thanks your time, for inviting me. Well, there we have it, Mr. John O. Marcus of Copper and Kings Brandy. The brandy resurgence is among us. There's some great grape apple brandies and some absinthe coming out of Copper and Kings in Kentucky. Great color, great smell, and absolutely delicious flavor. John, thank you so much for sharing your tales of growing up in South Africa, your journey here in America, and how you dove in to the hospitality industry on the beer distributor side. I mean, it's a really interesting tale, and I continue to keep in touch with John because I'm a huge fan of Copper and Kings, but a huge fan of American brandy. In American tradition, you know, peach brandy is something that's been around for centuries in America, and it has yet to see another rise in the recent cocktail resurgence. So let's make that happen. And of course, the Butchertown Brandy and Cast Strength Unfiltered Blend of Grape Brandies is just lovely. So, Jono, thanks so much for chatting with me, man. We'll grab a drink soon. 
And thank you for listening to Should V with Mike G. No matter how much you think a wiretapping allegation is absolute rubbish coming from the White House, the amazing dreamland that it has become, or if you're really getting into Nurse Jackie, as all the seasons are streamable on Netflix, please keep dancing.